Move from AI possible to AI proven with Dell Technologies. From struggling with siloed data to creating measurable value for the organization. From operating solely out of the data center to fast-tracking innovation everywhere. From developing a single AI use case to AI optimizing any part of your business. Collaborate on identifying, curating, and activating high-value data and test drive new technologies at our HPC and AI Innovation Lab. Put AI to work anywhere, in any way, with our best-in-class portfolio of hardware, software, and partner ecosystem. Our Dell-validated designs for AI offer pre-designed and pre-validated solutions, which are ideal for achieving success at any scale as you grow. With Dell Technologies helping you accelerate intelligent outcomes everywhere with AI, there's no limit to what you can achieve. What will you do with AI? Good evening. I'll continue my remarks once everybody has taken their seats. I hope you all enjoyed the receptions this evening. As we begin the formal program, please feel free to start on your first course if you have not already. And if you could please keep noise to the minimum, I know our keynote as well as our moderator and I would appreciate it, as well as some of your fellow attendees. I would like to extend a warm welcome to those of you all who are attending your first leadership dinner. Our leadership dinners are just one example of the ways we bring the public, private, and academic sectors together for vital relationship building and collaboration on pressing intelligence and national security challenges. This evening, we are delighted to host Principal Deputy Director of National Intelligence, Stacy Dixon, as well as her mom and dad. A round of applause for Stacy and her parents. Dr. Dixon and Dr. Dixon's parents, we thank you for your leadership, for your service to our nation, and for taking time to be here with us this evening. I know the audience looks forward to hearing from you and learning about your top priorities. I would like to recognize the organizations who have supported this evening's receptions and dinner. It's a really long list, so please be patient. Amazon Web Services, CACI, Dell Technologies, Ernst & Young, GDIT, Lidos, Lockheed, Mantech, Maxar, Microsoft, MITRE, Noble Reach Foundation, Oracle Cloud, Kinetic, Quadrant, RAND Corporation, Raytheon, Rebellion, SAIC, Sims Software, Strongbox Cyber Solutions, Texas A&M University, the Bush School of Government and P Public Service. Join me in a round of applause. And also a special shout out to INSA Chairwoman Tish Long for moderating the conversation later this evening. During the moderated discussion, we ask that you submit questions via the note cards on your table, compliments of Rebellion Defense. The incredible INSA graduate student interns, many of whom are looking to work for your organizations, will pick up the cards after dinner and share them with our moderator, Tish Long. As a reminder, this event is on the record and being recorded, open to the press. Compliments of Dell Technologies, it will be available on our website early next week. Now we're going to hear some prepared remarks by Dr. Dixon. Here to introduce our speaker, please welcome Ash Thinky to the stage. Ash is the Director of National Security at Amazon Web Services. Thanks for your support. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be here this evening in support of INSA and the work they do to advance collaborative approaches to national security challenges. At AWS, we're really proud of our partnership with the intelligence community, a partnership which began 10 years ago.
together, we have journeyed through the IC's first phase of digital transformation, providing the community with the speed and capability of commercially proven solutions. Today, the IC is more agile, more resilient, and more innovative because of this transformation. At AWS, we remain unwavering in our commitment to our IC customers and supporting their critical national security mission. We've made significant infrastructure investments and bought industry-leading commercial services into the classified regions. Our work with the IC has made AWS better as a whole. It's my distinct honor and privilege to introduce an extraordinary leader of the intelligence community. Dr. Stacey Dixon is the sixth Senate-confirmed Principal Deputy Director of National Intelligence. In this capacity, she focuses on intelligence integration across the IC, expanding outreach and partnerships, and driving innovation. Previously, Dr. Dixon served as the Deputy Director of NGA from 2019 to 2021, where she assisted the director in leading the agency and managing the national system for geospatial intelligence. From 2018 to 2019, she was the director of IARPA after serving as its deputy director from 2016 to 2018. An accomplished leader, Dr. Dixon holds a doctorate and a master's degree in mechanical engineering from the Georgia Tech, from Georgia Institute of Technology and a bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Stanford. Dr. Dixon serves as a presidentially nominated member of the Board of Visitors to the U.S. Coast Guard Academy and is ODNI's liaison to Spelman College, Center for Excellence for Minority Women in STEM. She's a native of the District of Columbia, where she currently resides. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the podium Dr. Stacey Dixon. Good evening, everyone. And first, thank you, Ash, for the introduction. Thank you, Suzanne, and the entire INSA team for allowing me to have this wonderful opportunity to be featured tonight. And for your patience, because I know you really issued this invitation in at least 2002, if not 2001, and you've waited for me to say yes until this point, so thank you very much. Uh, I would like to further recognize two really important people that are here with me tonight. You have heard that my parents are in the audience, so if you say anything nice about me in front of them, it's worth even more. <laughs> my dad, the Honorable Herbert Dixon, uh, retired judge, D.C. Superior Court. He is an unashamed electrical engineer as well. My mom, Phoebe Boykins Dixon, a retired executive vice president with Verizon and its predecessor organizations, and she is one of the best people to get advice from about people if you ever have any workforce issues. <laughs> they are proud graduates of Howard University here in DC, as well as of Georgetown Law School, <laughs> Howard. <laughs> Georgetown Law and George Washington University Graduate School of Business. The reason I mention those particular educational things is because if you're wondering where I get this interesting mix of my love of technology and the business acumen, it is from them. I'd also like to publicly, and I'm sure I've done this before, but I would do it one more time, publicly acknowledge uh, INSA Board Chairman Tish Long for uh, welcoming me when she became the incoming director of NGA and inviting me to be her director of congressional affairs. Uh, unbeknownst to me, and probably unbeknownst to her, it put me on the path to reach this position. So thank you, Tish. <clears throat> Coincidentally, today, August 3rd, is two years to the day and practically to the hour where I realized that the Senate had actually confirmed me. 
literally, picture this, me in my office, which is 90% cleared out because you have to be ready at the spur of the moment, but you can't assume it's going to happen, cleaning it out, watching C-SPAN. They were in the middle of the debates for the budget resolution of 2022. Uh, they had stayed an extra week to get it done. We thought it would be the day before. It didn't happen. I'm watching tonight knowing that if it isn't going to happen by the end of the week, I would have to wait a month because they were going on recess. Sure enough, at the end of the debate, Majority Leader Schumer comes up to the microphone, has some motions, uh, does some appointments, and then there's mine. However, it is couched in such a way that they're using all these words that you only hear when they're listening to a Senate or House debate on the, debate on the floor. So for a moment, I was not actually sure that it had happened. And I found myself thinking, I think I just got confirmed, but I really don't know. Anyway, it was. And needless to say, it has been a whirlwind two years since I started at ODNI on August 4th, 2021. Most immediately, there was the withdrawal from Afghanistan, which happened a couple of weeks later. And even before we could catch our breath, there was that strange and unprecedented buildup of Russian troops along the Ukraine border, which later became Russia's unjustified invasion of Ukraine in February 2022 which continues today at great expense, both in the lives lost, as well as the instability and insecurity that is created around the world. And today the world continues to face numerous challenges for which intelligence plays a starring role, including two critical strategic challenges that intersect with each other to intensify their national security implications. First, great powers, rising regional powers, and an evolving array of non-state actors are vying for dominance in the global order, as well as competing to set the emerging conditions and the rules that will shape that order for decades to come. Second, shared global challenges, including climate change and human and health security, are emerging as the planet emerges from the COVID-19 pandemic and confronts both economic issues and food, uh, economic issues spurred by both the food and energy crises. That description was taken from our annual threat assessment, one of the many documents that we post online to promote transparency in our work in order to both warn, but also to build trust with the American public. Now, recognizing that I am standing between us and dinner, I thought I would make just two more points before I sit down. One about ODI and I, and then one about the intelligence community of the future. ODI and I, which was established in law in 2004, and there are several people in the room who had a hand in shaping the organization, so thank you. It's nearing the end of its teenage years. We had a little bit of a, ro a rocky start. Anytime you add a new layer of decision making, and then take resources and people and money away from existing organizations, you're bound for things to not go so well. And that was despite the fact that the reasoning behind the creation of ODNI was something we could all agree to. The 9-11 Commission report identified flaws in the intelligence sharing process, and a key recommendation was greater coordination in the collection, analysis, and dissemination of terrorism information. Fast forward to today, and the DNI continues to serve as the President's intelligence advisor, as well as that of the Cabinet, while ODNI oversees the National Intelligence Program's $72.4 billion budget, as requested in FY24 and declassified by law each year. And we are focused on standardizing things that we, that we do in common, in, in integrating intelligence for our customers, and working with all the IC elements to be able to do things together that no one element can do on its own. We lead and support IC integration, delivering insights, driving capabilities, and investing in the future. Which brings me to point number two, the IC of the future. I have no ability to tell the future, but I have no doubt that the future threats will continue to be as complex as they are today. President Biden recently said that he expects to see more technology-driven change in the next few years than the last 50 which is quite something, as we've seen a lot of change since 1973. That year, the last person to set foot on the moon had just returned, and here we are planning another moon voyage. 
It was nearly a decade before the first personal computer. People did not have dial-up internet back then. In 1973, if you wanted to dial up someone, you dialed them on a rotary phone. <laughs> Yet not everything changes. In 1973, then National Security Advisor and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger was in China. And this year, just a few weeks ago, Henry Kissinger was in China. <laughs> Some things do not change. <laughs> but to be ready for the change that we will see in the next few years, let alone the change we will see in the future, the IC will need to move faster than even the IC of today. We'll need to drive insights from even more data and more information than we do today. The IC of the future must leverage expertise from wherever it is, in industry, in academia, around the world, more seam seamlessly than it does today. One way we at ODNI are seeking to lead the community towards this future is through our newly released IC data strategy. We'll work with the IC to do this through four focus areas, end-to-end -end data management, data interoperability and analytics, analytics at speed and scale, partnering for innovation and a data-driven workforce. Now, I could talk a lot more about the data strategy, but I will not. I encourage you to go take a look. It's posted on our website. We have a critical role to play at ODNI as a convener and as a customer in this transformation. And we do this to help of our, with the help of our industry, academic, and foreign partners. We do not just develop these strategies in a vacuum. We develop them after asking questions and participating in discussions with industry leaders and innovators. And if you have been part of any of those conversations that have helped us with strategies that we have completed or are developing, I thank you for that. I have the honor of being a small part of a community that leverages truly remarkable capabilities to give insights to policymakers. A community that is so mission driven that it becomes hard to say no when we're asked for help, which delicately balances sharing information while protecting sources and methods, and which continues to see the types of questions asked of us expand and grow. I am very proud of and grateful to the individuals that make up this community, who sacrifice, sacrifice their time, their treasure, and often working with windows to get the work done. <laughs> and I really appreciate this opportunity to brag on them just a little bit. So as I conclude, I want to say enjoy your dinner. Tish and I will be up here very, very soon to answer or to talk through, uh, have a great conversation and answer some of your questions. Thank you so much. So I hope everyone has enjoyed dinner and is moving on to dessert. Before we re resume the program, I just have two very quick announcements I would like to make while I have your attention while you're waiting for Tish and Stacy. Um, first, I'm really pleased to announce that the INSA Foundation today announced the seven scholarship recipients that we have built over the past three years. Cumulatively, these scholarships are, are valued at $50,000. These awards genuinely make a difference in the lives of these undergraduate and graduate students, all willing to work in a skiff for the rest of their lives. <laughs> three of our recipients are here with us this evening, and I can't help but point out they are all women. Brooke Gruber is a master's student at Marymount University. Brooke, can you stand? Samira Nuru is a master's student at Marymount University. And Emily Roberts, who is a dual degree program at Penn State University. Sorry about that. Um, I really think our future is bright with these young ladies, and if you haven't had a chance to get to know them yet, I bet they are all pursuing careers, if not already doing internships in the intelligence community. So thank you ladies for joining us this evening. And finally, I wanted to mention that today registration opened for INSA's The New IC program on September 27th. This full day program focuses on the challenges and opportunities 
our community faces as we build, foster, and advance gender inclusive and a diverse workforce. We will have a wide array of programming ranging from panels to Ignite rounds to keynotes, plus plenty of networking time, which INSA is often known for. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our moderator, Tish Long. Tish's career accomplishments are almost too many to count, but I will anyway. Director of NGA, Deputy Director of DIA, Principal Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, and Deputy Director of Naval Intelligence, just to mention a few, as well as the Chairwoman of INSA and the INSA Foundation. We are thrilled to have her lead the discussion this evening with Dr. Dr. Dixon. Tish, Dr. Dixon, over to you two. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Suzanne. And let me just add my good evening and welcome to everyone. It is terrific to see everyone. Um, a special welcome to our scholarship recipients. Um, we had the good fortune, Stacy and I, to have two of the recipients at our table. Our future is bright. Um, and I just also want to welcome and recognize Stacy's parents also. I had the good fortune of meeting them when was it, Stacy? Uh, 2010. 2010, 13 years ago. Um, Stacy mentioned that I recruited her from uh, Capitol Hill and I promoted her to senior executive, so her parents attended that ceremony. And it's just wonderful to see you again, Herbert and Phoebe. Um, so glad you could be with us this evening. Now, Stacy, you said something in your remarks about, I probably didn't know you were gonna be the PDDNI. Well, that's true. I, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, but like your mother, I'm a pretty good judge of people. And I knew you were going to go far. I also know I'm not the smartest person. So I like to surround myself with the smartest people. You know, a couple of folks came up to me earlier this evening and said, Dr. Dixon is the smartest person I know. And I said, yeah, I know. I hired her. <laughs> so... Even if you did go to that other tech school. <laughs> hmm. Go Hokies. <laughs> Yellow Jackets. <laughs> we got that rivalry thing going. All right, well Stacy, um, thank you again for being here this evening. We have been asking you for a little while. So glad that, that we could finally align the calendars. And as you can see, a lot of folks here wanted to hear from you this evening. I'd like to key off a couple of things that you said in your opening remarks. And you know, you talked a little bit about um, Ukraine and Russia's invasion of Ukraine and just the impact that that is having um, from a global perspective. One thing that you, you didn't mention, um, but we actually heard from the Principal Deputy National Security Advisor John Finer at our summit a couple of weeks ago. And he discussed the administration's policy on what he refers to as strategic downgrades. Um, and, and really it's, it's all about information sharing and the strategic use of intelligence. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, not only perhaps the impact that it has had on the hostilities, on the war, because that's exactly what it is, uh, but how are you thinking about the release of intelligence going forward? What does that mean about information sharing with allies, et cetera, et cetera? Absolutely, and certainly yeah. you can imagine we've been getting a lot of questions about this going forward yeah. and so what precedence are we setting? Exactly. Which is yet to be seen. But mm -hmm. in terms of how we came up with that initial decision, I mean, certainly in your, if you're looking at something and you, know, you have the inputs and the sources that we have, you see something happening you recognize that your allies and partners aren't seeing the same thing or aren't interpreting it the same thing. And so your next question is, well, how do I have this conversation with them? And how do you make a decision like that, knowing that you have to give up some of your sources to be able to share that information? In conversations with the administration, it was, it was definitely a policy-driven thing that the intelligence community responded to. 
They wanted to be able to have the conversation at many levels, at the military level, at the di diplomatic level, at intel, the intel levels. And the only way to do that would be to downgrade information. And so that mm. was the first step. How do you downgrade it for your partners? And broad, broader definition of partners, given the number mm -hmm. of countries involved, NATO plus. From there, you know, the continue, you know, we, you can imagine you do a little bit, and then the next question is, well, can you now downgrade this? And so how do you then balance this, this uh, hunger that you sort of created in being able to share more and more information? And you know, it's a lot of risk conversations that happen by a lot of people in the community. And it certainly goes back to those that are, would be the losing the most if the information revealed mm -hmm. their sources. Like we don't wanna give up the information we have today and that will prevent us from having it in the future. And so it's sure. a very delicate balance that I think our teams have worked really hard to maintain and then to try to get the, the downgrading process to move more quickly because of the, the, the speed that's needed, number one, but also the, uh, the amount of requests that have been coming in. So a couple of things from that. Is there a technology aspect that can help with that downgrading or speed of downgrading? I mean, I know there's you know, a lot of really um, human interpretation that has to happen. Uh, but we've got a lot of smart folks here, you know, our industry partners also um, within government. What about um, technology helping there? Right now, it's not a lot of technology helping, unfortunately, but we definitely see the future where we're going to have to increase our use of technology in both downgrading and then even just declassification. I mean, that's a huge part of what we do. Not everything needs to be classified forever. And so getting to the point where you're letting technology help you because there's a lot of holdings that are hitting that timeline when you have to review them for yeah. potential declassification. And there's legislation right now that's requiring us to look at how, how and what we classify. So the, not only is there a signal that we need to do this, but we know that we need to do it internally. Uh, if nothing more than to make the processes less manual, to ease those folks who are doing this day to day, give them some assistance with the technology. And certainly with natural language processing, machine learning, artificial intelligence can help a lot. And there are tools out there that we can leverage. And getting that information out to the American public also, yes. I think is, is very important. I, wa I wanna come back to technology, but it, you know the flip side uh, of where we started with um, the downgrading of intelligence to, to share with partners. There's also a lot of information out there in open source. So, um, y y you know, we sometimes joke that, you know, if it's not secret, it's not worth, you know, looking at. But we know that's not the case. Um, and, and I know that the DNI's office is working, uh, I think you're looking at hiring an open source executive, and you recently had a study presented to you with a lot of recommendations. Are we going to have another agency in the community? Our goal is not to have another agency in the community. <laughs> OK, you heard that here. Yes. Uh, there are studies that are suggesting that that's what we need, mm -hmm. though. Uh, we think that we can accomplish the goals without starting another agency. The, the problem with another agency is you need a good portion of the people just to run the agency. And if you're looking at you know, how do you keep organizations small, that's not the way to do it. How do you focus what we've been doing and do it more efficiently? How do you create a trade craft and uh, practitioners who are all consistently trained around the community to do open source intelligence? That's where we're headed. And we've had, we've had a couple of different organizations that have focused. We've got the open, port, open source enterprise. DIA has an open source or organization as well. We need to kind of bring those two together and create more standards and more consistent training between all the practitioners. But you know, I will be the first to say that, that the community writ large sees a lot of value in open source. I think in back in the day, we could, the criticisms that we weren't using it enough were, were true. Now, I would say we're not given credit for what we do use. We don't talk about it as much publicly, probably, for good reasons. But we are very interested in what it can do for us. And now it's a matter of how do you make sure that we have everyone using it the similar ways, tra treating it just like other intelligence disciplines where there's a trade craft, there's training, there's standards. That's what we need to bring in. And that's what the open source executive is going to help with. It's going to be a very small organization that's going to help get things kickstarted that have sort of not made it to the level of maturity that we think needs to be there. And then you hand it back to functional managers to deal with it. So, so why do you think the community hasn't been able to do everything you mm. just said. Uh, you know, we had an open source organization 
the Community Open Source Program yeah. Office, uh, gosh, back in the late 90s. You know, so we've been talking about this we for have. a long time. We have. What do you think the, the barriers have been and how are you looking at breaking those down? I mean, to be fair, well, and well, okay. how, can, <laughs> how can industry help? Your comment that if it's not from a sensitive source that we control means it's less trustworthy, there, there's, a, there's a piece of that that we know we have to deal with, right? Mm -hmm. When it's not controlled information, you can't trust it the same way. However, we have to figure out what we can use it for and how we can trust oh it more. Goodness. How do you build that in? How do you use it as in corroborating evidence as well as an initial starting point and then use your, your sensitive and more scarce collectors for other things? We need to think about that and how we're training our analysts to use mm -hmm. it. I think that's one of the things without having the trade craft of people who actually, their first, their first uh, primary mission is to start off using it, using open source. We don't train people like that right now. Uh, open source intelligence or open source enterprise used to really focus on translation. Like, how do you just bring in the information mm -hmm. from overseas? There's a lot more to it than just the translation part. So we need to sort of bring in that, you know, what are sort of the best of things we can get from it? And we can certainly learn from a lot of organizations who get great intelligence for their own particular disciplines and needs from open source material. Mm -hmm. So we do have a lot to learn and industry can definitely be a part of it. Yeah, I mean, we both know NGA does a pretty darn good job in using commercial imagery. Um, State Department uh, does a lot from their diplomats. You know, so there, there is a lot out there that is being used now. So um, watch this space. I, I think this is um, a, a, an initiative where I certainly hope you all are gonna make some real progress. I, I'm and sure I, and I think others do as well. Um, so, so let's talk about technology, mm -hmm. because technology can, can help you there. Um, but also, just across the board, um, maybe starting with the, the positive aspects, if you will. How is artificial intelligence being applied now? What are some of the, the shortfalls, uh, maybe initial lessons learned? And again, how can industry help? I mean, you, you sort of think of our community and how much data we're sitting on right now. And, and sort of your initial thought is, of course, this would be perfect for AI. Data that was collected for other reasons and not tagged for AI use. So there's a mm -hmm. barrier to being able to use what we have right now. But with great chief data officers around the community, we're really thinking about how do we, how do we make sure the data that we're collecting from this point on is AI ready. How do you make sure that you can use it, use the machines to help you with it going forward? So we have some catch up to do for back for other data. And then it's a matter of, well, do you put all the resources to tagging, especially tagging things that have to be done in a classified manner? There's a lot of cost that goes along with it. It's just not, you know, we can't sort of do the same thing that China would do and just have armies of people that are cleared that do nothing but tag data. Like that is just not cost effective mm -hmm. for our community. But we still need to figure out how to use that data. So data aside, that is one of the first lessons that the data wasn't ready for the AI we wanted to bring forward. Bringing in people now who, are, who, are, um, uh, who can write the necessary algorithms, who understand the data in that level, who can actually develop those, the code. We're bringing more and more of those folks into the community or people are sort of self-teaching themselves and really expanding their skill set. So that's a good thing. I think the workforce, we're developing it, but it's something that, as I mentioned with the data strategy, being able to have a data-ready workforce is still a goal, so we still have to continue to work with that. We're using AI and machine learning, we're using machine learning in certain really, really good cases and to good effect. It's not nearly as widespread as any of us knows it needs to be, and so that's something we will continue to work through. I see a lot more use of automation. Mm -hmm. First step, how do you just make sure you're getting some of those tedious things that you have to do over and over again? Make sure that the machines can help you with that. That part is going well. The use of machine learning is sort of the next one, and then to really use it for helping you make decisions. Mm -hmm. um, that will be a, bit, a step in the future. While we're doing that, though, we have the opportunity to build in the privacy and civil liberties protections, the AI protections that we all know are needed. So we're trying to do it in a very smart way, thinking about that while we're trying to increase the use in the community. We don't want anyone to judge us as not having taken heed to what we're hearing researchers talk about in terms of the biases that can be built in. How do we make sure that we're not doing that? So there's a lot left to do. But yes, we also need help on that. Yeah. And it of course, there's a lot left to do, and the technology is, is changing, changing, you know, so rapidly. Um, 
I mean, how are you thinking about the guardrails, the framework, the, the ethical use of? Um, it, will there always be, and I, I hate to ask a question like that because I'm not sure, we know what, what the future actually is, but will there always be a person in the loop hmm. you know, when it comes to making that assessment? It's hard to say if there will always be. There will certainly be for a while for those mm -hmm. most critical decisions that you need to make, certainly when you, any of that would impact lives. Uh, we're, we're pretty excited though about the technology and, and where it can take us. We also know that because it's so widespread, the barriers to entry are so much lower that many adversaries and individuals who otherwise would never have been able to use this kind of technology for their own purposes now have access to things the guardrails, one really great thing that's happening right now, and I think this was the advent of you know, the large language models and sort of the splash they made and how quickly they were adopted by people for good and, for good and bad. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more conversation we're having with those that are developing the kinds of models. Like they are looking to government to uh, allow us to, or encourage us to, to, to create regulation and legislation in a way that will help protect without harming business. Recognizing that there are a lot of people who will use this very quickly for, for bad purposes. How do you make sure that the guardrails are built in? How do you make sure that the, the models are protected? So there's, 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 there are worries, there are worries out there that were, but I mean, I think the excitement about what you can do with those kinds of models, with unclassified data, you know, later with the IC's data, like there's a lot of excitement about that. We wanna do it in a, a very smart way and methodical and having thought through the what ifs. I, I do think it says something when you have the CEOs of the major tech companies signing a letter to Congress saying that we do need to think about the, the laws and regulations here. So It's a great partnership. I mean, I, I'm happy yeah. we're here in this place. There's certain, there's certain fields where it's taken a long time for government, industry, and others to work together. And you know, we've sort of seen in cybersecurity uh, arena, for example. It's taken a while to get to the point now where there's, there's so much trust between the organizations, mm -hmm. and we need to keep that. This is how we protect ourselves, not only within the IC, within the government, within the nation, is by everyone talking to each other and making sure that, you know, if something happens to one organization, it's not just the one organization, really. It could happen to any of us. How do we, yeah. sh the shared protections will be really yeah. important. We are connected. Mm -hmm. um, there are cards at all the tables if anyone has questions. I have plenty, but I do like to, thank you, Bishop, I do like to ask questions from the audience. And in fact, I'm gonna merge um, one that I received from the audience earlier with one that I had, teeing off of something you just said, and that is that the data wasn't ready for the machine learning algorithms, and you talked in your opening remarks about the new data strategy. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what, uh, you know, what near-term and maybe mid-term impacts that's going to have on the community? Oh, that's good. I, you know, that's a really good question in terms of the timelines. Uh, part of it is helping us think about ourselves as sort of data organizations, right? We, you know, we, yes, we're intelligence organizations, but we really, you know, the, the, the thing that we're focused on, the thing that we have is information and it's data. If we can continue to like change the mindset of people to think about data first, in terms of how you're building your systems, it's to deal with the data. You want to also take it so it's not just each individual intelligence discipline being done in its own separate silo, right? You want to make sure that you're able to, to use those things together to, to good effect, to have multimodal models to be able to, I don't know, I don't know exactly what they'll be able to achieve, but I just have this vision that bringing the data together earlier in the system and not waiting till the end and then merging it will be very, very powerful, but you've gotta have systems that can do that. We've gotta build those. Mm -hmm. To date, it's been mostly, you know, each organization doing its own thing. So you've got your great, data, great uh, repositories for SIGINT data, which is different than the great repositories for GEOINT data. Mm -hmm. We figured out how to work together with them, but I think there's, there's, uh, there's, there's even more potential in the future if we build our systems from the beginning to be able to do things like that. And so making us have to come up with data management plans is a huge piece of it. Like how do you think about your data from end to end, from the moment you collect it, to how you're gonna use it, to how you're gonna dispose of it, so that you build that into the system. How do you make sure that you've got analytics that not only can work for the one, one small thing, but can scale to the level that you need it and do it at the speed that you need to. So being able to keep up with mission in that. 
These are things that we're going to need a lot of help with. Yeah, I, I never thought about, I'll tie it back to something we talked about earlier, and that's the declassification. Thinking about, you know, how you tag that data right up front for 25 years down the road when you have the mandatory declassification. It could definitely help the Makes folks sense. who have to do that. Right? And, and actually, I left out the part of the audience question, which mm -hmm. was, um, do you see the introduction and implementation of multi-cloud helping with the IC data strategy? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think, frankly, that I'm very excited that we have several cloud, uh, cloud providers, even at the TS level. Uh, just added another one, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oracle. Um, so we're really excited to have more in the family to be able to use, because I think you know, it, it's going to be very powerful for our community to have access to so many. And it also helps with resilience, you know, right? We've got to be able to make sure that we're resilient. So it's going to just uh, open up a lot of opportunity for us. Well said. Um, got a number of questions here. Let's see where we want to pivot next. Um, this actually is to both of us. Oh, yay. <laughs> I was going to ask you a I've, question. I've never Tish. gotten a question that's, that's for both of us. So, I, I, you know, and I was going to ask you, because one of the things both you and DNI Haynes have talked about is developing the workforce. You know, it, it, yes, it's about the data, and at the end of the day, it's about the people. It's about the people. So, and I really do like this question. As two strong, intelligent women, <laughs> yeah, how do you help to diversify the IC, both government and industry, mm -hmm. and how do we ensure our youth are engaged and interested in the IC? So within government, Let you I'll start, start there. <laughs> One of the things that we have done, we've been doing it a while. We, we, have, we capture the statistics of what our organizations look like. We're doing it now in a much more detailed and automated way, and then being able, and then actually, actually showing the results to the workforce. Like we actually have data dashboards that show the demographic makeup of our agencies. Let us know what we look like as compared to the American public, which we know we don't, we aren't reflective of right now. Part of it is sort of knowing where you're starting so you know where you need to head. Uh, with that, you can create great strategies on how you're going out and recruiting at schools that frankly don't ever get to see someone from the intelligence community that comes to come, you know, doesn't come there. I have gone out, whenever I go out traveling to go do whatever, I try to tack on college as well as a high school visit. And just to see the students who are hearing about the intelligence community for the first time and, and having someone say to them, you know, there's a place for you in here. If you want to come and serve your country, protect national security, and get to do some really interesting things over the course of your career, not only are there people that might look like you, mm -hmm. but they're people who are successful. So a piece of it is knowing what we are, knowing what we need to recruit to look more like America, and then getting out there and doing it. We've actually got some really good training that we're also helping. Because, you know, we don't always know the best way to talk to different communities. So great recruiter training that is helping people understand how uh, different communities hear the information that we're providing them, how to make sure that we're not using triggering words or words that are going to basically turn off different communities. So we're trying to be smarter about the way that we are advertising and recruiting mm -hmm. folks. But we have to hold ourselves accountable at the end of the day. Uh, we're morphing to a, a system where we're going to work a lot more with OPM with respect to USA Jobs, which is going to allow us to ca collect a lot more demographic data than we already collect. So we can find out if people aren't making it through the process. Are particular groups not making it through the process in the same way? Like, we need to be able to figure out if there are barriers so that we can deal with those barriers. So I think it's um, a, just terrific that as you go out and travel, you tack on a visit to a college, and a high school. And I think that's something that all of us can be doing um, because it is about educating. You know, it's not about how Hollywood portrays the intelligence community. It's about real life and what we do day in and day out. And, you know, we are all normal people. Well, most of us are anyway. <laughs> and, you know, so just, just being able to talk about what we do right. Um, you know, in real terms, I, I think it's, it is really important. So I think that's um, really a terrific idea. And, uh, you know, holding yourself accountable, certainly the companies I work with um, do the same. 
And at the senior levels, it's often tied to their compensation and their compensation plans. Um, so, you know, are you, you know, truly trying to build a diverse workforce that is reflective of the American public? We are trying I mean, to learn some of those best practices from industry and uh, at a minimum know that there's a way of performance objectives. Do we do have a diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility mm -hmm. performance objective? Being able to tie it to compensation is something that we are definitely considering. Uh, right now, it's, it's one of many of the performance objectives that a person would have that have yeah. to all be met. Of course. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, the marketing is, is inter interesting, and I think industry really has a leg up on, on the government. I can remember when I was deputy director DIA, and we actually brought in an outside marketing mm -hmm. firm to look at all of our recruiting materials and why we were lagging most of the rest of the community um, on our representation of women. And they took a look at all of our brochures that all had, rightfully so, you know, pictures of men in combat. It's a combat support agency. Hmm. Might not have been the best way to recruit women. So we diversified our recruiting materials, and lo and behold, took a little while, but diversified a little bit better. Um, our recruiting as well. And I think so. at the end of the day, like we all need to bring enough people into our communities. Like we are all recruiting. There are certain folks who are never going to want to work with the intelligence community. They're never going to work for the government. I want to make sure that we're casting that wide net so that those who are willing and able and have the talent and skills to come in, come in no matter what they look like, no matter what their backgrounds, what part of the country they're from. Like we need to be a more welcoming. To, to, yeah. to make sure that we don't have the vacancies because the mission is just, it, the mission's gonna be there and we need to have the people to do it. And the mission is way cool. It is. <laughs> How are we doing at recruiting folks with the right tech background? We're, we're, doing, we're doing better. So we have the opportunity now, I know DOD just passed and I think some of the other agencies that are not DOD had the ability before to do more, um, what do you call it, the Hiring bonuses, incentive pay to be mm -hmm. able to, you know, re re reward more technical skills. It does not compete with what people can make in industry, but it does help a little. What we're finding, though, is you know we have people in, we're losing people pretty quickly. You guys are making, you guys, industry folks, you guys are making some good offers to some of my really good people, <laughs> and taking them from me. And they you know, recognize talent. They do, which I appreciate. Mm -hmm. And it's it's in in some cases, and I'm going to quote life changing money for someone who's got about to put some kids through college. I get that. And I'm hopeful that they will come back into government at some point in time, but we are losing, uh, especially in the IT space and the cybersecurity space, we are losing people. We've got to figure out how to retain. So how is the public-private technical exchange program going? So I think that's yes. up and running it at this point. It is getting there. So we have the, you know, the policies written. We actually have the first so public-private talent exchange, exchange, an opportunity for both government people to go out into industry for between three months and three years, and then to bring industry into government, same sort of time frames. Uh, right now, we've got the first area we're going to focus on is space. We have identified uh, two individuals and a company, and we're working through the paperwork. So I think within the next couple months, we're actually going to get that kicked off. And that will be the first round. But we've got a couple of other uh, industries that we're also um, uh, targeting. And we had a, there was a good number of people who came to the industry day. So there's a lot of companies that have shown some interest. Good. Is that just for the ODNI or across the whole? Because I, I, I know some of the agencies already do this. I don't know. I don't know. I think we would have done it for the whole, that's a good question. I don't yeah. know whether other agencies have to do it another way. I know, I know it's for, uh, actually no, it is. It is for everyone, because yeah. one of the people is from a different agency. Okay, yeah. good. Um, so another audience question here, mm -hmm. keying off your remarks. Now that ODNI is almost out of its teenage years, how do you see the role of the ODNI evolving within the IC over the next 20 years? And, um, especially as we're talking about, I won't even say near peer, peer, the potential for peer conflict. What I've seen during the course of this, these two years is a much better understanding and alignment with a much better understanding of what policymakers' needs are. So how do we make sure that we're answering the questions that policymakers have? 
in a way that is useful for them to be able to make the decisions they need to make. I'm seeing that has matured a lot over time. Right now, I feel like we have a very good understanding. And again, as I mentioned in the, in the remarks, the types of questions we're getting are expanding a lot. There's a lot more in these areas that we didn't really have a lot of resources before. There's a lot more threat finance, economic security. There's a lot more on certain aspects of so climate and global health. So we're having to figure out how do we ex make sure that the IC has enough people who can do this, but also that our connections to industry and academia, where some of this expertise lies, that we have different ways to be able to partner with individuals. So I see in the future us going for a model where it's not that we necessarily grow a lot bigger, but we figure out how to leverage talent where talent is. And for those who are willing to help and support government needs to answer these questions that we have access to them. So I see hopefully also a much more sophisticated way to measure the return on investment of the investments that we make. We are working towards okay. that now. We're you know, using, using data-driven analysis to be able to look at not only what money you're putting in, analytic products, the number of people, are you closing those intelligence gaps, are you answering the questions that policymakers and your, your strategies say that you need to answer. We're trying to create, uh, again, dashboards that we can actually look at ourselves mm -hmm. how we're doing to figure out, you know, if you got another dollar, where do you put it? Where's the best place to put that next dollar to make sure that we're going to continue to advance the cause of the mission? So I see us getting a lot smarter in that area. Well, as a taxpayer, I appreciate that. Um, so one of the reasons the ODNI, the DNI was established was to improve information sharing. What grade would you give the community right now? Hmm. I, I I suppose it would, it, that would be hard to give one grade. So I would suppose it would depend on, on the particular issues. Because for certain issues, we are so well connected that I would have no, no qualms giving us an A. For other issues, I am sure there is work to do. Um, we are recognizing, and the, the nice thing about the, the national intelligence managers that we have is that we do look for whatever your particular mission area is. We're able to do a sort of a health assessment of the mission. And we don't make ourselves give ourselves grades, so that, that's a little bit why it's harder for me to do it at this point in time. But we do assess how well we're doing with collection, with analysis, with closing those intelligence gaps. So we are trying to measure ourselves. In those cases where it's working really well, it is working really well. Like the number of collaborations that take place, it's just second nature. In other places, we still need to grow that because it's still kind of divided up. So, mm -hmm. you know, I would probably say between C and A, depending on the topic. Depending on the topic. Yeah. Okay, fair. You're a hard grader, so <laughs> I, I, I know you're, you're, you're thinking about that. Um, a lot of questions coming in, and we only have five minutes left. Wow. I already know what my last question is. Um, so let me merge a couple of these. Um, what are the top three national security challenges that you think no one talks about enough and therefore is the proper focus there? And then I'll, I'll give you a part two. Is there one thing, if there is one thing you can solve that is seemingly insurmountable, what would it be? Mm -hmm. So those are actually kind of different, but <laughs> I put them together. <laughs> I do think we need to keep our eye on biosecurity, right? We saw the impact of what a natural virus did. Something engineered, targeted, could do a lot worse in a shorter period of time. Like we need to keep our eye on that. Um, and I do see the community working more. And part of that is, is the IC working more with those health-focused organizations that are already in government as well as with academia to make sure that we can have the questions answered. So we're growing in that area, but it is one where I think we focus a lot more on nuclear and chemical weapons than we have on bio. So mm -hmm. bio is one area that, that we need to invest more in. Oh, let's see. Some of it, that you, the top three, and then, and then you said that no one's thinking about. Or, or isn't talking about. Isn't talk. <laughs> I, I, there's something, and I alluded to it. Like, it is the fact that, it, that technology is democratizing the ability for technology to aid people who want to use it for ill. So 
country, or, 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 or non-state no. actors, terrorist groups who should have no business with an artificial intelligence model that is going to actually deliver some, I don't know, deliver something that they would not have otherwise been able to, to do on their own, now has the potential to have that. that. We're talking about it a little bit, but I think that is another area where the guardrails that we talked about, mm -hmm. uh, the need to protect what you have so that mm -hmm. it doesn't get into the wrong hands, definitely needs to be uh, talked about more. And, and that is a con those are conversations that we're seeing industry take. Uh, I'm gonna have to pass on the third one. I can't think of anything right now. I'm sure there's something. It's okay. Um, Th those were two pretty good ones. But I will. I can't miss the opportunity to say uh, one thing that I would love to, and it's not insurmountable, but it's something that we know we have to work on. We are, we're trying to reauthorize uh, FISA 702, Section 702. It is extremely critical to intelligence mm -hmm. collection. We are working very closely with our partners on Capitol Hill, but not everyone is supportive. So um, to the extent that you all know people and know what it can do for you, please say good things about it. And if you don't like it, don't talk about it at all. That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> but that is one thing. If yeah. I, could, if I, I want to see us yeah. be successful, to, reauthorizing, yeah. reauthorizing, and yeah. not necessarily without any change, but reauthorizing it before it expires at the end of the year. That it, is a huge thing for it, the community. And, and at the Intelligence and National Security Summit, I had the honor to interview Senators Warno, Warner and Rubio, who, as you know, are both very supportive. And um, they said the number one issue was educating yes. everyone in Congress, that the intelligence committees had not done a great job educating their compatriots, and that the intelligence community has not done a good job. So I'm glad you brought it up so we could say that many, many people if not most everyone in this room, do understand that section and understand the importance, understand the guardrails, right. to use that term, that are there, the checks and balances. So um, certainly from INSA, we will keep advocating. Appreciate that. And, that. and we're putting out more information. We've got some great infographics that we now have on uh, dni.gov. We're trying to declassify more, or downgrade and declassify more examples so people actually can understand the what. Like, why is it yeah. important in having those conversations? Yeah. And that's, you know, we often say, yeah, I can't talk about what we do. We can talk about what we do. Maybe not how we do it, mm -hmm. but we can talk about what we do. So um, if INSA can help in any way, please let us know. Um, before I get to the last question, we really haven't talked about China. Mm. So <laughs> we could spend all night talking about China. Um, what, what keeps you up at night about China? Ooh, so most recently there was the news article that they had uh, two Navy officers were just arrested for having passing secrets, mm -hmm. right? Um, yes, so, so China looks at us and thinks that we're trying to contain China. Uh, what I say to that answer, that, that question is, is uh, China has a view of the world and the view of the future that is a world that I don't want to live in that way. Mm -hmm. So we have a responsibility to make sure that we are you know, working with like-minded countries to be able to make sure democratic principles, democratic values are out there. Um, that means that we've got to do our best to figure out and navigate this, this period of competition mm -hmm. and be prepared if there needs to be a period of conflict later on. But we're gonna be working as a community to make sure that we are able to protect ourselves. And a lot of that is protecting things that we have no control of in the government, right? Our critical infrastructure needs to be protected and we need to work with those partners out in public sector, out in you know, states and locals. So this DHS, FBI, IC, uh, partnership to get the word out, to educate, to help support as these, these organizations make themselves more resilient because all of us rely on strong critical infrastructure. I would also say that China does a pretty good job of containing themselves, you know, from a, you know, monitoring their, their people perspective. Absolutely. Absolutely, um, but they're they're out there. They will they will loan money, give money to people that you know we don't give to others quickly or will not give to in the same way, and they are making a lot of progress. They have a lot of connections in a lot of places in the world, and while people go to them sometimes as a last resort because they would rather have us as a partner, they will go get where the money is, and we've got to be mindful of that and and think about the kinds of alliances that they're able to have, 
even if they're unwilling ones, they still have them, and they have mm -hmm. people who are moving away and dropping their affiliations with Taiwan, for example, right, because of China's pressure mm -hmm. on them because they took money. So there's a there's an alliance they're trying to build, but we also have very strong partners in many places who are getting a lot smarter about their dependencies on China and trying to make sure that they are resilient in the event that there are issues. As we were discussing Africa during yes. dinner, yes. Okay, we have come to the end of the evening. Stacy, this question is from your mother. <laughs> it's a great question. What do you do outside of work <laughs> to ensure you maintain your work-life balance? Ooh. And I bet actually a lot of people truly want to know the answer to that question. I mean, it, these jobs are extremely hard. They take a lot from you. They take a lot of time. In order to continue to do your best, you've got to take care of yourself. So... What's that strong, intelligent woman doing to take care of herself? Well, I am blessed to have family local, which is really nice. So I, I do make sure that I spend time with my parents, my brother, sister-in-law, my niece, um, and then try to schedule time for friends, of course. Day to day, it's a, it's a, so there's, there's exercise, there's eating right, there's drinking enough water and getting enough sleep. I cannot do them all at the same time, <laughs> but I am trying to do as many of them as I can in any given week and trying to be mindful of that so that I can continue the long hours. Um, the balance is not exactly there right now, but I am working to, at least when I'm not at work, to make sure that that is as fulfilling as it can be so that I can have that kind of balance in the time that I do have free. Great answer. Better answer than I could ever have given <laughs> and I ever did give when I got that question. Stacy, thank you so much. This, um, I believe, has been worth the wait and we really appreciate you coming tonight and speaking with all of us and having this conversation. My pleasure, Tish, well and thank done. you everyone for coming out. And Stacy, we have an INSA baseball cap, so you can enjoy that personal time while you take care of yourself. So I didn't ask the question about how was that first pitch? <laughs> I saw the picture on Instagram. Stacy got to throw out the first pitch at the Nats game. Oh, it, pretty cool. If only you had had your INSA hat on. <laughs> it, not, not my best throw ever, <laughs> but I did not embarrass myself. I will say that. That was what All I wanted right. to make sure going, and it was a lot of fun, so I, I can't complain. It was a really enjoyable time. We had some other folks from the community come out with us. Some great, yes, yeah, check out dni.gov's Instagram because they've got yeah. a slow motion throw as well as some great pictures of, of, of us on the field. Yeah. Well, now you have a cap if you're ever asked back. So <laughs> anyway, so thanks Tish and thank you Stacy, for sharing your evening with us. And if you all will just bear with me, I do wanna thank our sponsors again, Amazon Web Services, CACI, Dell Technologies, EY, GDIT, Lidos, Lockheed, Mantech, Maxar, Microsoft, MITRE, Noble Reach Foundation, Oracle Cloud, Kinetic, Quadrant, RAND, Raytheon, Rebellion, SAIC, Sims Software, Strongbox, Cyber Solutions, and Texas A&M University Bush School. And of course, thanks everybody for sharing your evening with us. Please take home the flowers, share them with someone who might appreciate them. Compliments of CACI and stay safe and healthy. And we look forward to seeing you at our programming later on in August. Have a good evening. <laughs>